why you're here, Mr. Wordsworth? Yes, sir. I'll ask you to speak up a little, if you will. Yes, sir. I know why I am here. You've been under investigation, Mr. Wordsworth, for the mandatory period of one year and 11 months. You are found to be obsolete. The purpose of this hearing is to make a finding in the matter and make a sentence accordingly. Do you understand that? I understand that. Your occupation, Mr. Wordsworth? A radio talk show host. <laughs> a what? A radio talk show host, sir. I'm told you've had counsel and been given orientation, Mr. Wordsworth, but I'm still not sure in my own mind that you understand the purpose of this hearing. The field investigators in your sector have classified you as obsolete. This finding carries with it serious implications. Do you understand that, Mr. Wordsworth? Now I ask you again your occupation. I am a radio talk show host. That is my occupation, my profession. If you people choose to call that obsolete... Request clarification of the term? Yes, the term, uh, Mr. Wordsworth. You people, you make reference to the state. I make reference to the state. And you persist in declaring your occupation, correct? That is correct. A minister. A minister would tell us that his function is that of preaching the word of God. And of course it follows that since the state has proven that there is no God, that would make the function of a minister somewhat academic as well. There is a God. You are in error, Mr. Wordsworth. There is no God. The state has proven that there is no God. You cannot erase God with an edict. You are obsolete, Mr. Wordsworth. You have no function, Mr. Wordsworth. You're an anachronism, like a ghost from another time. I am nothing more than a reminder to you that you cannot destroy truth. You're a bug, Mr. Wordsworth, a crawling insect, an ugly, misformed little creature who has no purpose here, no meaning. I am a human being. I exist. And if I speak one thought out loud, that thought exists, even after I'm shoveled into my grave. Delusions, Mr. Wordsworth. Delusions, the Bible, poetry, enemies, all kind of an opiate to make you think you have a strength when you have no strength at all. You have nothing but spindly limbs and a dream, and the state has no use for your kind. Yeah, but we're going to have to do something about that. This is RiverWestRadio.com, community-supported radio streaming live from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm your host, my name is Michael Wordsworth, and welcome to Breaking Down the News, the show that presents the news highlights of the week, but with a twist. Breaking Down the News is more concerned in bringing you information that wasn't covered on the front pages. Headlines you don't want to miss, because not listening could be dangerous to your freedom, liberty, and health. Good afternoon, everyone. Today is Wednesday, May 23rd, 2012. I'm Michael Wordsworth, and these are Words Worth Listening To. You just gotta love the audacity of the U.S. federal government and its active staging of crimes in order to achieve political goals. Operation Fast and Furious is the most recent example of a U.S.-run criminal conspiracy pursued for the ultimate purpose of dismantling the Bill of Rights. It involves ATF agents running a criminal scheme that sold literally tens of thousands of guns to Mexican drug gangs, after which the government planned to call for gun sales restrictions. Following the wave of gun violence, that would inevitably result. There was only one problem with the government's evil plan. However, some ATF agents blew the whistle, and then the whole conspiracy exploded in their face. Now even the mainstream media, which usually won't touch government conspiracies, is all over Operation Fast and Furious. Heck, the LA Times even has an entire special section dedicated to it. And the paper is actually producing some decent stories on the subject. The mainstream media bought into the cover story, but breaking down the news will in fact break it down. What's clear about Operation Fast and Furious is that it involved not only the ATF, but also the White House. 
The LA Times and other mainstream media papers are incorrectly reporting it as a failed sting operation, but that's just the cover story. In reality, Operation Fast and Furious was a raging success. It achieved its stating goals, which was placing thousands of rifles and pistols into the hands of Mexican drug gangs, then hoping enough violence would spill over into the USA that the American people would call for gun sales restrictions. Whether you believe in the Second Amendment or not, you've got to admit, this is a particularly insidious conspiracy because it has the government directly promoting sales of weapons to criminals. Normally, when you walk into a gun store, you can't buy a weapon without passing an FBI ground check. So there's a safety mechanism in place to prevent guns from being purchased by felons or non-citizens. But in this conspiracy operation, the ATF specifically told gun store owners, such as Lone Wolf in Arizona, to sell guns to criminals. Even if they didn't pass the background checks. This is just one example of how the U.S. federal government has become a criminal organization that promotes gun violence in America. Remember the conventional cover story for all this? That the guns were going to be, quote, tracked, end quote, to see where they ended up. There's just one problem with this whole story. There were no tracking devices installed on any of the guns being sold to the criminals. Thus, the whole idea of tracking these guns is ludicrous, and the government's official cover story falls apart yet again. The purpose of Fast and Furious wasn't to track guns, but to arm criminals, and then hope enough bodies would pile up that the government could call for restrictions against the Second Amendment. Not to mention that the particular cartel members that received these guns were the ones that were paying their funds to the correct banks. In fact, even though the government has been caught red-handed in this operation, it has already begun to roll out the gun sales restrictions it planned all along. Documents acquired reveal that the gun shops throughout Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas have been ordered by the ATF to report any sale of more than one rifle or pistol to any single person. Unbelievable. Thus, even though the FBI already runs background checks of purchasers of firearms, the ATF is now creating a second layer of burdensome paperwork on many sales of firearms. Importantly, this adds no additional background check security to the gun purchasing process, which is already subjected to FBI approval anyway. Even worse, this entire process is being done completely outside the law, using solely the regulatory bullying of the ATF itself, the very same agency that is technically a rogue government agency steeped in criminal behavior. A lawless government? It is, if we don't pay attention. Did you ever notice how the federal government never faces any consequences when it breaks the law? But if you or I sold guns to Mexican drug criminals, holy schmoly, what would happen? We'd be facing decades in prison now, wouldn't we? As we've all seen from numerous examples, the government today is lawless. It's a criminal gang that breaks its own laws with impunity. We now know that the U.S. government staged the 911 terror attacks and brought down the World Trade Center building number seven using planned demolition charges. This isn't even questioned by any rational person anymore, as thousands of architects and engineers have gone public in stating that WTC7, the third building to fall, some of you might not know that there were three buildings. There were three buildings to fall, not just the two big ones. The other one, completely unrelated, a demolition job. It takes weeks to set up those charges, and it was pulled the same day. Larry, Larry Silverstein's on video saying, we made the decision to pull it. Well, Larry, buildings aren't built in with bombs in them. We also know that the government conspired to put tens of thousands of weapons directly into the hands of criminal drug gangs. Listen to what I'm saying, people. They're out of control. Time and time again, the federal government actively plots to break up the law in order to crush freedom and usurp power from you. The taxpayers, yet the mainstream media largely doesn't cover any of this. And the mainstream sheeple, 
of America are for the most part too dumbed down to even believe what's really happening. There's no telling what the government is planning and plotting right now in its evil scheme to draw, destroy our civil rights and unleash a total police state in America. And that's America with a K. How Hitler, baby. What Operation Fast and Furious really proves is that the U.S. federal government will openly endanger innocent lives and break any laws it wants in pursuit of crushing freedom in America. It's not even about the guns, you see. It's about the tactics that the U.S. government now uses to achieve its own political aims. Is it our government? Who runs it? Rather than going to the people, and that's with the capital P, us, we the people, and asking for our rational views on security versus freedom, the government stages its own catastrophes and crimes in order to get people to react so that the freedoms can then be stolen from everybody. Isn't that what the terrorists were accused of doing themselves? Remember when George Bush said that the terrorists target America because they, quote, hate freedom? But it turns out that the real haters of freedom are the rogue agents within the federal government itself. The real roots of modern-day terrorism, it seems, are more easily found in Washington, D.C. than Iraq or Syria. It was said in World War II by the Nazis, we were just following orders, sir. And it's being said today. Are there good agents in the federal government? Absolutely there are, and they know what's going on. Some of them, the newer ones, don't. But the other ones that have been around for a while, they know. It was the ATF agents themselves who blew the whistle on this ATF conspiracy in the first place. There are FBI agents who do good work to help protect America from legitimate threats. I'm not saying that. At every level of law enforcement, there are men and women who put their lives on the line with great courage and real sense of duty. Yet sadly, there are just as many government agents who are ready and willing to commit serious crimes as long as they are told to do so. They make no distinction between good or bad and merely follow orders. That's how we ended up with Operation Fast and Furious, which was no doubt the brainchild of a bunch of gun haters at the White House who decided it was somehow okay for them to break the law as long as they were wrongfully framing and blaming gun shops. In their minds, you see, the ends justify the means, so they believe they can commit any and all crimes necessary to achieve their final goal, which might have nothing at all to do with guns. It might be a goal of crushing the raw dairy industry or keeping hemp illegal. Hemp? Hemp seeds? It would be an industrial revolution in this country. But God forbid. Or even outline, quite recently, home gardens. That's right. Outline home gardens. You wouldn't believe. I can't even get into that right now. Take my word. We will cover that. Or call in right now. If you don't believe me, 414 935 2591 is the 2951. That's again, 414 935 2951. There's no telling what our federal government will do next in its out of control desire to crush freedom and destroy our rights. It could stage its own terrorist attacks, unleash bombs in major U.S. cities, poison the water supply, or even stage the deaths of U.S. Navy SEAL team members like it already did, and it would do it all with a straight face, claiming to be protecting America. This is why government is so inherently dangerous. When it becomes so large and powerful that it can run criminal conspiracies, conspiracies with impunity, it's only a matter of time before the government itself becomes the enemy of freedom and spends more time figuring out how to destroy the nation they're protecting it. I'm Michael Wordsworth. Welcome to today's Wednesday show. Back in a minute. You're listening to RiverWestRadio.com. From 
from Chicago, site of the largest NATO summit in the organization's six-decade history. On Sunday, veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, as well as members of Afghans for Peace, led a peace march. Thousands of people, Iraq veterans against the war, held a ceremony where nearly 50 veterans discarded their war medals in disgust by hurling them down the street in the direction of the NATO summit. A powerful statement it was. We hear the soldiers' voices as they return their medals one by one from the stage. Quote, I am here to return my Global War on Terror Service Medal in solidarity with the people of Iraq and the people of Afghanistan, said Jason Hurd, a former combat medic who spent 10 years in the U.S. Army. He said, I am truly, deeply sorry for the destruction that we have caused in those countries and around the globe. And he is right. It was needless. We have a long track record, folks. Through our acquiescence to ignorance and mediocrity and complacency, we are, in fact, allowing this empire, the Anglo-American empire, the U.K. and the United States together to spread horrible, horrible bedlam, torture camps in Central America. Hell, now in our days, torture prisons all over the world, secret rendition camps where they can just take people and question them. You think it's good because you want to be on the side, the winning side that is hard on these terrorists? Look closely, people. Look closely. They're coming for us. It won't be long. We'll be the new terrorists in America. The new Al-Qaeda will be anybody, any, especially any middle-class citizen that complains, saying, oh, the taxes, the inflation, all of this is out of control. Well, <laughs> it's being done on purpose. It's not out of control. It's all online. It's exactly what they want. I'm Michael Wordsworth. You are listening to Breaking Down the News. The number to call in is 414-935-2951. The National Lawyers Guild condemns a preemptive police raid that took place at approximately 11.30 p.m. Wednesday in the Bridgeport neighborhood and instances of harassment on the street in which Chicago police are unlawfully detaining, searching, and questioning NATO protesters. The Bridgeport raid was apparently conducted by the Organized Crime Division of the Chicago Police Department and it resulted in as many as eight arrests. Well, I covered it earlier, but you know what those arrests were for? Making beer. Beer bottles said that they were bombs. You don't even need to be. It's guilty until proven innocent nowadays. Protesters are in full force demonstrating against NATO as they announced the European Missile Shield is coming. The European Missile Shield is something that the Russians aren't happy with. An excerpt from CBS reads, NATO Secretary General Anders Fowl Rasmussen said Sunday, the declaration of interim capability at the Alliance's summit in Chicago is a first step toward a goal of establishing full coverage of Europe by 2018. We're still, we're still at it. A final stage is planned for 2022 that would also provide coverage of the United States from Europe. 2022, look, there ain't going to be a, tw- you know how far that is right now from, from, from here, from 2012. Ten years. I understand you can do math, but my point was more metaphor, metaphorical. We are so far off from 2022, I don't think there will be a United States in 2022. It'll be called some other freakish thing. It'll belong to some dictator or tyrant, or it'll be a global government. We'll all be dead, in prison, starved to death, reallocated, re-educated. Ugh. Not a happy sign. I don't like bringing this news. It's not a good thing to wake up. I'd like to believe that the future would be rosy and cheery, but it's not. Sitting with our heads up our ass isn't going to... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Heads up our butts isn't going to solve the problem. Good thing we don't have our FCC regulation yet. That's that's why. I mean, it's just kind of... Can't watch the language on there. Anyhow, I know there's children out there listening, possibly, potentially, and we want to keep this a family-friendly PG show, but the news that I'm bringing to you is far more horrifying than any monster movie, any devil Satan movie. It's scary. Also in Chicago, it has just been police 
bashing all weekend long. There are so many lawsuits from the indiscriminate beatings, including even the CNN reporters said that the journalists that were beat up, journalists, I mean, the guys are down there covering the protests on the front line. They're not technically protesting. They're working just as the police officers working. I mean, you see a guy with a camera, you got whatever. And if you can't, if, as a police officer, you can't discern the difference between a, a civilian that's getting out of line is truly harmful or just peacefully protesting. Or if you can't tell the difference between a, an agitated protester with potential violence on his mind or a journalist that has a microphone or a camera in his hand, you must be an idiot. Yeah, but that's true. They like to hire police officers now with an IQ of 100 or lower. It didn't used to be that way. But I noticed the average cop in the streets just getting dumber than, well, insert your vulgar expletive there. They're getting dumber. They're getting meaner. They tend to despise the public, and I'm not here to cause a division between the public and the police. The police were obviously a necessary element in providing law and order in our communities. But where did the disdain for the, the citizens themselves come from? Too many cop shows. Remember that cop? Bad boy, bad boy, what you gonna do? All they'd ever show is the retarded white trash of America engaged in drugs or lunacy and the crap that the police officers had to put up with these goofballs. Never once did they pull over a decent citizen, a guy driving to work, a woman driving to work, uh, and say, uh, look here, America, this is, this is the other side of the coin. It's not all degenerate morons in this country, but somehow the police, in a rather gang-like mentality themselves, are more and more looking upon us with disdain. You know, what do you want us to do? You would just want us to just line ourselves up and shoot ourselves, and then you won't have a freaking job. If there's no us, there's no you. What are you going to do, police yourselves in the end? It's asinine. NATO, the whole reason that we protested this weekend, collectively as a people, NATO approves the deal for Afghan transition. We got to remember that we were, while people were on the street, world leaders, including our own, were in there, our world leaders, were inside deciding what NATO, its military forces, and its political policies that it enforces are going to do and this affects us greatly. Some of us know this, some of us don't. But one of the things that was decided, the NATO leaders have approved a deal for a military transition in Afghanistan that would hand control the Afghan forces next year. Not a bad idea, actually. The question is, what Afghan forces? And really, they're pulling out for different reasons. That front's been lost. Pakistan no longer wants to work with us because we keep killing their people with drones. And right now, you got about 100,000 troops sitting on an island just below the Arab Emirates. I forget the exact name of that island, but I don't want to re reveal the government's secrets. That would be an awful place to bomb right now. And please don't do that. I support our troops. Shouldn't even said such a thing. Uh, our, our troops, the majority of them, they're not going to turn on us. It's those National Guard little pretend wannabes that get the little power trips. Those guys are all too ready to just, uh, we're going to just throw our weight around with our big bellies and our guns and our badges. Let me tell you something, guys. If this comes down to it, the people against the, the military, the people against the police, the people win. You can't win in asymmetrical warfare with 140 million gun owners. You're just not going to do it. Most of you, you got to think about it. When you're over here arresting somebody else's grandma and putting her in a detention camp, who's protecting your grandmother? I mean, who's protecting your family and friends? When this is all said and done, they got a uh, no child will be left behind. There is a jail cell waiting for every last one of them. So under this new agreement with NATO, which would withdraw its combat troops, by 2014, but leave thousands behind in training and advisory role. Now, keep in mind, these are NATO troops. We're not even calling them American troops. We're calling them NATO troops. I mean, did you vote for anybody in NATO? Do you even know what NATO is? Why are you spending money on a military that NATO uses to just protect the global elite and the banksters?
President Obama hailed the deal as a way to bring the Afghan war to an end. What freaking war? They tried to get rid of the opium in their country. Our government worked with the Taliban, and under the pretense of 911, and that Iraq is a threat, <laughs> they invaded Afghanistan, secured the opium, and oh, it's been flooding ever since. President Oda Obama. Oh, President Obama, he said, quote, at the International Security Assistance Force meeting this morning, we agreed that Afghan forces will take the lead for combat operations next year in mid-2013. At that time, the ISAF forces will have shifted from combat to a support role in all parts of the country. Combat, huh? Like when our guy, allegedly one man, went out and blew away 16 Afghans? Look, I'm not proud of saying this. I don't want to hear that our service members killed innocent lives because he's probably on psych meds. So many psych meds because these guys have completed so many tours of duty. Boy, I hope the Armed Forces members get a hold of this show. I'm talking for you guys. I know you want to come home. I was in the military my, myself. I almost said my damn self. Good enough. Well, anyhow, this... Transition will mark a major step toward the goal that was agreed to in Lisbon, completing the transition to Afghan led for security by the end of 2014 so that Afghans can take responsibility for their own country and so our troops can come home. What, from all 168 military bases across the world? I mean, is that really necessary? NATO fails to end dispute on Pakistani's supply line, and I don't blame them. They're probably saying, look, wh why? Just stop bombing us, and maybe we'll work with you. They did originally against this fake war on terrorism. They agreed to it. So did Gaddafi. <laughs> that's what you get for shaking hands with the devil, and that's what we're doing, America, shaking hands with the devil. But remember, he always screws you in the end. So despite the agreement for Afghanistan, NATO leaders were unable to resolve the ongoing dispute of reopening Pakistani supply routes to NATO, a step seen as essential to an orderly withdrawal. Look, Afghanistan is kind of packed in there by Pakistan and Iran. What do they got to the north of them? The uh, Turkmenistan, I believe. It's a lot of mountain range. You got the Kapit Mountains dividing it right along the Iran border. Uh, oh, mountainous region. It's not like our, it's a very, very tough region to get troops in and out of. We had 90,000 at one point. I forgot what they've been with, withdrawn down to. We got them out of there, but we need Pakistan's help to do this. Are, are we going to work with them? Nah, who knows? They, they, we'll see. They have an agreement. The agreements mean nothing because the words of our leaders mean nothing. They speak out of both sides of their mouths. Pakistan has shut down NATO supply lines over the U.S. refusal to apologize for a raid last year that mistakenly killed 24 Pakistani soldiers. Oops, sorry about that. Well, Mr. and Mrs. America, I'm sorry about that too. I hope you are as well. Can't keep going like this. I'm Michael Wordsworth. You're listening to Breaking Down the News. The number to call in, 414-935-2951. We'll be back in a minute. Neocons in Washington Post, quote, military strike on Iran would calm nerves in the region. Really, a military strike in Iran would calm nerves in the region. Since it's Orwellian. You know the book 1984 George Orwell wrote, predicting the totalitarian takeover of society? Well, it has double speak in here. It would be good. This is double speak. This is like right is left, up is down, good is right. Uh, I mean, right is wrong. A military strike on Iran would calm the nerves in the region. No, I think it would be like throwing a rock in a hornet's nest. 
They shut down the Straits of Hormuz. And I'm telling you, Mr. and Mrs. America, you're going to be paying 8 to $10 a gallon at the gas pump, making these petroleum giant megalithic corporations even richer while you get even more poor. Go ahead. Continue this asinine foreign policy. You're going to pay for it at the pump. I'm not the only one saying this. But now you got the stuff that the Washington Post puts out. It seems to think that the United States is not in enough overseas wars. It runs a piece by Matthew Kronig and Jamie Fly urging us to pursue the military option with Iran. All options are on the table, remember. Quote, they say, on Iran, it's time for Obama to set clear lines for military action. We want clear lines for military action because their nuclear reactors, which are incapable of producing weaponized plutonium, uh, are a threat, even though our CIA and the IL, IAEA has said that it's not a threat. We don't care, America. we got to attack Iran. You're stupid. You're going to believe it. We're going in there. Huh. Morning, have a great night. I can't stand the neocons. I can't stand the neoliberals. You're both full of crap. You're you're not committed to one side or the other. You just stand behind your parties because you're too incapable to think on your own. It's pathetic. It's extremely pathetic. If you can't think for yourself, listen to somebody that's on your side. I'm on your side. Even though I'm cutting you down, it's not. It's kind of out of love that I'm doing it. I'm not just here to insult you. I'm here to wake you up and realize that there's no choice. You can't pretend to go to sleep anymore and it's all going to go away. It's encroaching upon us daily. Jamie Fly is at the Neoconservative Foreign Policy Initiative. Ne- you know why they call them neoconservatives? Because they're not true conservatives. The older people remember what conservatism meant. The older people remember what liberalism meant. Neo means pseudo-fake, wimpy, washed-down versions of the original ideas. We don't even know these terms anymore. A neocon, a neoliberal, is a fake. They're posing in the guise of either side. Well... The Washington Post ran a piece by Matthew Kronig and Jamie Fly urging us to pursue military option with Iran, saying that Obama needs to set clear clear lines for military action, as if as if there hasn't been enough rhetoric about attacking Iran. I've been reading about them attacking from Iran for about 12 or 14 years. I was surprised I could tell they were going in there back then. If you notice, all the countries that we're occupying surround Iran. Jamie Fly, I don't know what, where did you get this? Are you just a paid operative? Is this it? You just, you know, I can understand selling out. For a price, maybe everybody can sell out. But there's something you can't sell out, and that's yourself, your family, your country. If you do it, we're all in a lot of trouble. There's no negotiating with these insane people. Kronig... One of the guys calling for this old neocon policy to invade Iran, he's at the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR. For those of you that don't know, the Council on Foreign Relations was an organization that they denied existed for a long decades. It doesn't exist, they said. Well, today we know it does. And you got to find out, Google, CFR, these guys have been around, I think, since like 1938. Well, they worked in the Obama Defense Department, Kronig, and this CFR. So much for change, you can believe in, huh? Probably a Lester Crown play. The Obama supporter was a militant on Iran. Steve Walt took Kronig's argument for war apart last December as a textbook example of warmongering disguised as analysis, and he's right. That's a great t- That's a great way to put it. It's a textbook example of warmongering disguised as analysis. There's no basis for this war. There was no basis for the WMDs that were allegedly in Iraq either. Remember that, America? General Powell and Condoleezza Rice got up there, showed us some crappy little illustrations of train cars with potential weapon-making stuff in there, scared the crap out of everybody in the country, and they're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we, we got to invade, we got to invade. God bless America, kill them Arabs. Folks, the, the Iranians and the Iraqis aren't Arabian. 
Saudi Arabia is a completely different country, like uh, about 800 miles to 1,000 miles to the west of Iran. I mean, if you attack a country or approve of our military attacking a country, you need to know where it is on the global map. That's my criteria. You at least need to know where the freaking country is and who the people are that you're killing. Let's be crystal clear about what Kronig is advocating here. He is openly calling for preventative war against Iran, even though the United States has no authorization from the UN Security Council. It is not clear that Iran is actively developing nuclear weapons, and Iran has not attacked us or any of our allies ever. Iran has no history. You know, the only thing that Iran appeared was in the Shah of Iran uh, back in the 70s, uh, was replaced. Uh, our puppet dictator, I believe, was replaced by another puppet dictator, Ayatollah, and uh, some student activists ended up taking uh, 50 of our citizens. But that all worked out in Ronald Reagan's favor because it made Jimmy Carter look like a wimp. They just, the whole media, it's all a big show to get us more to believe and, and vote the way they want us to. Isn't that obvious? Why do you, how can you believe some of the lie and not others? I mean, it's all a lie. Well, Kronig is therefore openly calling for his country to violate international law if he, if he truly approves this. He is calmly advocating a course of action that would inevitably kill a significant number of people, including civilians, some of whom probably despise the clerical regime. It's, it basically, it's a theocracy in Iran. A theocracy, theo meaning Greek from, for God, an ocracy, a form of government, theocracy. We have a democratic republic, but it's mostly a bureaucracy. Anyhow, Kronig is willing to have their deaths on his conscience on the basis of a series of unsupported assertions, almost all of them subject to serious doubt. Here are Kronig and Fly in the Washington Post stating, the Obama administration has articulated only one bright red line, building nuclear weapons. But if we wait until Iran turns the final screws on a nuclear device, we probably will be too late. The Iran Why the hell would the Iranians attack us? I mean, think about this, America. Why would you launch a preemptive nuclear strike? Russia wouldn't do that to us. They have enough sense. They know you launch anything to this country, literally, if there's one country that can wipe another off the face of the planet, or off the map, as they like to say, it's us, the U.S. <laughs> The administration, they say that the administration's pledge to use force if necessary also rings hollow if Iran is allowed to make significant progress in all other areas required for a weapon. Well, they say that the United States can strike Iran's nuclear facilities to prevent Iran from making weapons-grade uranium, but once it has the fissile material, the game is over. Oh, be scared. Be very scared. Uh, Washington has a spectrum of viable military options, they say, including a limited strike against a few key nuclear facilities. Remember, folks, what I told you, you let this go down, you attack Iran, that Straits of Hormuz will not be kept open. They've got 30,000 tow missiles or some kind of missile pointed at that thing. Mines, our military said that they can keep it open, but I'm telling you, it isn't going to happen. Approximately, what is it, a third of the world's, or two-thirds of the world's oil supply goes through those straits. It's right in between. It's in the little Straits of Hormuz. It's right around the Persian Gulf there, right around the corner of Iraq, going up into Iran. Not a good idea. This proactive approach should help calm nerves in the region about Obama's medal and could forestall Israel from taking matters into its own hands. <laughs> what are you going to do, Mr. and Mrs. America? I'll tell you what you should do. Get informed. Stay informed. Stop believing the lie. Stop being so polarized on these issues. Thank you, ma'am. We just got a thumbs up from the studio audience here. Appreciate that. It's no joke. I think more people today are on the side that I'm talking about. They are awake. There's an estimated 80 million people at least that are awake to what's going on. You, you're only going to hear about this from independent news sources. All the corporate media has been bought and paid for. The senators and the congressmen bought and paid for. Fox News, Rupert Murdoch. Fox News, Rupert Murdoch. Just look at this guy. 
He's under scandalous investigation. I, I Actually, I need to follow up on that case. I usually don't care about this kind of media thing, but Rupert Murdoch owns too much and has played too long for the corporate media whores to put out this uh, message that just keeps America and the world dumbed down, this preoccupation with all this silliness. But in that case, I'm sure everybody heard about the girl that was killed and the phone, how the, the media went in there. It's just a classic example of just the insanity is everywhere. I'm Michael Wordsworth. We're breaking down the news. It's a beautiful Wednesday afternoon, a little cool. Please get out there if you get a chance. Thank you, ma'am. Take care and come back. In the meantime, I'll be right back myself. I'm Michael Wordsworth, and this is Wordsworth Listening To. An open society is a free society, and the media's primary job in helping to maintain a free, open society is to shine the light of scrutiny on the government. In doing so, the media lives up to its supposed mantra of inflicting the comfortable and the comforting the afflicted. The only thing that could possibly get in the way of that mission is, of course, the government. Though one of its surrogates in the federal court system. That's how it's done. In an effort to shed some light on how the government interprets its own Patriot Act, New York Times reporter Charlie Savage filed suit against the federal government last fall to get some answers after a Freedom of Information request was shot down by the Justice Department which said the interpretation was, quote, classified. Well, Charlie Savage's suit followed several earlier warnings by Democrats, Democratic Senators Mark Udall of Colorado and Ron Wyden of Oregon, members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, who said in a letter to Attorney General Eric Holder Jr. in September, they said to him, They believe the public has been misled about how the government is interpreting law. Too secret to disclose? Well, here's a quote. Here's a quote. We believe that the best way to avoid a negative public reaction and erosion of confidence in U.S. intelligence agencies is to initiate an informed public debate about these authorities today. They wrote, however, if the executive branch is unwilling to do that, then it is particularly important for government officials to avoid compounding that problem by making misleading statements. Savage agrees and tried to sue the government to get some answers. He believes correctly that the public should know what the enforcement parameters are for such a wide-ranging, quote, terrorism law. We're talking about the Patriot Act here. But U.S. District Court William H. Pauley III disagrees, writing in a recent rejection of Savage's suit that the government's anti-terrorism efforts, which are supposedly authorized in the act, are too secret to disclose. Well, here we go. Section 215 of the Patriot Act authorizes the government to apply to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court for an order directing the production of any tangible things for certain investigations, Polly wrote in his dismissal. How do you like that? The government, he, Polly wrote this, and to continue, the government, quote, contends that its use of this authority is critical to countering national security threats. You mean like all the foiled terrorism plots that the FBI instigated? That's right. Just happened again with another underwear bomber, this time with the CIA. They foiled their own plot. Good job. This is the great threat. You know, since 911, they've only said, well, w- th- there has been no terrorist attacks. I mean, do you remember any? 
all I all I remember is a bunch of half drugged up retards being brought on television, and we're told that these guys actually presented a real threat. Well, that the one judge sentencing one of these guys said it's not possible. This guy's buffoonery is absolutely Shakespearean in perfor- proportions. He couldn't have committed these crimes if the FBI hadn't helped him. Well, who are you going to find somebody is stupid enough to actually go and do this? The old harm national security excuse again. Where have we heard that before? Light burden of proof for Uncle Sam? Savage, along with the American Civil Liberties Union, a co-plaintiff in the case, argued that Wyden and Udall have made statements on the public record contradicting the judge's findings. For instance, Savage, in a March 18 story, said that Udall and Wyden told him Americans would be stunned and angry to know just what Uncle Sam believes the Patriot Act actually authorizes the government to do. And they would. The Patriot Act. He said... We would also note that in recent months, we have grown increasingly skeptical about the actual value of the intelligence collection operation, said the senators, as reported by Savage. This has come as a surprise to us, as we were initially inclined to take the executive branch's assertions about the importance of this operation at face value. Take nothing at face value from from the government. There's always an agenda behind the agenda behind the agenda. Just all you need to know to simplify things that they'll screw us whenever they can unless we're vigilant, hyper-vigilant against them. Furthermore, Polly doesn't believe the government's burden of proof is light and that its claim of privilege under the law takes precedence to say the Constitution of the United States, the thing that we founded this country on and our whole entire basis of government. <laughs> It's extremely misleading. I'm going to go on. Polly wrote, This court credits the government's assertion that disclosing this information could enable America's adver- adversaries to develop means to degrade and evade the nation's foreign intelligence collection capabilities. Polly, Polly wrote this after examining Section 215 in private. It's a very important section of the Patriot Act. He said, this court's in-camera review confirms that disclosing the report would reveal and potentially compromise intelligence sources and methods. Well, in September, the New York Times reported that the senators criticized a Justice Department spokesman's statement saying, quote, Section 215 is not a secret law, nor has it been implemented under any secret legal opinions by the Justice Department. Wyden and Udall said that characterization is extremely misleading because there are, quote, secret legal opinions controlling how Patriot Act is interpreted. It's just that they were issued by the National Security Court, as the Times reported. So much for a free and open society. The Senate Appropriations Committee on Tuesday moved forward with the legislation to increase airline passenger security fees, beating back a GOP attempt to keep them at current levels. The 2013 Homeland Security Appropriations Bill would increase one-way fees for passengers from $2.50 to 5 bucks in order to close a budget shortfall at the Transportation Security Administration. Well, it's not bad enough that the post office, the police department, and everybody else is claiming a budget shortfall. I thought we were in a recovery. You know, if the taxes were flowing in, we wouldn't have budget shortfalls, and that would indicate that we are recovering. Ha! Well, the TSA, they're the next group to want a little handout. We need to molest your children in the airports and insult the dignity of our elderly through World War II veterans included by... Uh, fondling them so that the terrorists won't win. What? What? We're going to just give up our dignity to put up with this? Well, Sen- Senator Mary Landrieu said that the $350 million in funding would otherwise come from taxpayers and argued it is better to stick passengers who rely on TSA with the bill. What do you think? Then the number to call in here is 414-935-2951. Feel free to call in. Disagree. Agree. 
I prefer you disagree. It would be better. I like to just read this information and get somebody. This stuff is new. It's shocking. You, most of us have not heard this information. It's out there. You can find it. You're just not going to find it on your televisions. Sometimes you do, actually. But you know what? Judge Napolitano, he's been taken off. Glenn Beck, he's been ta- Not that I liked Glenn Beck, but he did actually say things that were true every now and then. I mean, he was basically asking America to wake up. He got so deep into it, he started to freak out. It didn't become funny anymore. It's not funny when you find out how serious this is. If you understood the things that I'm talking about, you could not possibly just go about the rest of your lives anymore. You would actually have to do something. It doesn't matter what your plans are from this point on out. They're being made for you because when you don't run your own lives, somebody else will run them right into the ground, right off the road. Can't hide anymore. You can't sit there pretending. You can, but it's it's too late then. It's all over. When you're sitting in the FEMA detention center getting re-educated, remember what I said to you. When your family members are dead from starvation or hauled off, remember what I said to you. Well, moving on with the news today, in the aftermath of conservative columnist Charles Krauthammer's hammers, whatever, Krauthammer's, there we go, Charles Krauthammer's observation that the first person to shoot down a surveillance drone on U.S. soil will be a folk hero. Well, the drone industry wasn't happy about that. And it's committed itself to launching a propaganda blitz at bombarding the public with positive messages about the technology. Quote, after issuing a statement denouncing Krauthammer's remarks as irresponsible and dangerous, Michael Toscano said the AUVSI, just another freaking acronym for another organization that's running your life, will go on the offensive against critics. While the strategy is still being shaped, Toscano made it sound like something straight out of a crisis management textbook, or Orwell himself. The AUVSI, another acronym acronym for an organization that runs your life, wants to bombard the American public with positive images and messages about drones in an effort to reverse the growing perception of the aircraft as a threat to privacy and safety. Oh, you know what? One of those drones almost collided in Colorado with a passenger jetliner. They plan to, they have 30,000 drones, and somehow they think America is going to be safer flying them all over the place. Who's got the fuel for this? Where are the global warming freaks when this kind of thing comes out? Anyhow. Moving on in a minute, we're going to cover how the People's Bank of China is the Chinese central bank and holds more financial assets than any other single public institution in the world. Well, the State Administration for Foreign Exchange manages the foreign exchange reserves for the Chinese central bank, which exceeds $3 trillion. To put this into perspective, the next in size to China is Japan, which manages foreign exchange reserves in excess, excess of $1 trillion. It's a lot, actually. Japan was the fourth largest economy in the world. I don't know how they're faring now, but the size of Chinese, gov- uh, Chinese reserves is disclosed, but the composition of the reserves is less transparent, and we are going to talk about that in a moment. I'm Michael Wordsworth. These are words listening, worth listening to. Back in a moment. The composition of the Chinese foreign exchange reserves is regarded as a state secret. What actually makes up these Chinese foreign exchange reserves is regarded as a secret of the state. However, reports from the Bank for International Settlements, which is known as the BIS, yet another big acronym for an institution that very much affects how you live on this planet. The BIS should just be called the BS. The Bank for International Settlements should just be called BS. 
nonetheless, very powerful central bank. In fact, it is the central banks of central banks. That's where a lot of this money is coming from. Well, anyhow, the reports from the BIS suggest that the United States assets represent 60 to 70 percent of the Chinese reserves. That's a lot. This lack of diversification has been costly to China as the U.S. dollar, the Federal Reserve note, depreciates. You got to understand, China at one point was holding 1.4 trillion dollars of our debt. Our debt is bought by other nations. It doesn't go away to magic debt heaven. It sits there looming uh, over us like a dark cloud becoming heavier and heavier until the clouds themselves weigh 2,000 pounds and fall and crush us. At least metaphorically, our economy, and therefore us. Well, as an example, between 2003 and 2004, the Chinese lost more than $60 billion in asset value due to dollar depreciation. I mean, how would you feel if you were holding on to the dollar? We don't think about that over here. Sometimes a depreciated dollar is actually good. It makes our exports appear attractive. But in this case, if you're the Chinese or any other foreign bank, you're not happy to see the dollar go down in value. <sighs> The private Federal Reserve controls the American money supply. Listen, the private Federal Reserve, it is no more federal than Federal Express. It's an open statement now. We have a private bank called the Fed with its wonderful Goldman Sachs employees, former employees running it. Well, they control the American money supply through lending to banks, individuals, and the government. The U.S. Treasury prints and sells bonds, loans with interest, known as T-bills to the general public, foreign countries, and back to the Federal Reserve. We're buying all of our debt because the Chinese don't want to hold it anymore. I believe we're the biggest holder now of our own debt. Don't you wish you had that ability, Mr. and Mrs. America? You could say, I know I owe you a lot of money, Bob, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy back my own debt. You going to give me money, Mike? No, 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 no. I'm just going to take the debt and say, I own it now. You haven't solved the problem. I understand. I understand. That's just the way it is. The private Federal Reserve creates electronic fiat currency, currency with no actual value other than the authorities that gave it uh, value by fiat from thin air to purchase the treasury bonds and holds these bonds as reserves for every dollar of reserves it creates another nine dollars for circulation in the nation's banks to lend again to businesses and individuals do you get that money hell no thus the money supply is constantly depreciated and the national debt is perpetually expanded a scheme concocted by the banker cartel and sold to the american public as the natural business cycle as a result of depreciation and floundering american credit ratings China has sought to hold other currencies and asset classes. Can't blame them. The strain on Sino-American relations undoubtedly is the reason why we now are hearing the bombshell news that the United States Treasury, for the first time in history, is directly selling government bonds to a foreign government. This means the Central Bank of China now has an exclusive purchasing arrangement not available to any other central bank in the world. Even Japan, who maintains a substantial and consistent purchasing portfolio of United States bonds, must still use Wall Street banks designated by the government as primary dealers. The reports disclosing this ultra-secret relationship suggest China now has a direct computer link to the U.S. Treasury auction system. Hey, maybe that's why they're trying to buy up the land in Michigan and set up a new communist China right here in America. You think I'm kidding? No, I covered that issue a few shows back. Just look at it. Chinese interest to buy up Michigan property. No public announcement was made. No warnings were given to primary treasury dealers. To be clear, no law exists that forbids such an arrangement. But this monopoly arrangement remains exclusively available to China. The implications of this arrangement are significant. Listen, they are. Unlike the privately held 
Federal Reserve, run by a secret international banking cartel, the United Treasury is a government entity, and all such arrangements could should have a congressional blessing. China is essentially skirting price gouging that occurs as primary dealers have historically exploited Chinese purchasing patterns. It is clear that China is now enjoying a favored client status given its massive investments in the United States Treasury bonds. This is not new for the Treasury as it regularly ignores its public service role. In 2009, the Treasury got caught when it secretly changed the rules for Chinese treasury purchases, only to subsequently relax and amend the rule under Chinese pressure. The treasury is still operating under a veil of secrecy and remains unresponsive to efforts to disclose this new dangerous relationship. Wall Street traders are very aware of a phantom trader in the auction of treasuries due to undeniable pricing anomalies the Treasury is undoubtedly scrambling to craft language palatable for the American investing public to swallow. The implications of this arrangement are undeniable. First, a Treasury that believes it has the right to act secretly is dangerous, very dangerous, but also represents expanding collusions with its sec secretive Federal Reserve master. Second, the current astronomical holding of U.S. debt by China is a national security risk in itself. In the sense that if it is China decided to sell its holdings, it would collapse the market, our market, and send interest rates sky high. Right now, interest rates are so low, they can't hit the lower. They're playing handball on the curb. Third... The direct access mechanism does not promote transparency. It perverts capitalism and provides China with unilateral economic leverage that it could unleash to invoke an economic war. Listen, people, if you believe in America and you're at least a neocon supporter of these warmongers' lies, you should listen to what I'm saying now and realize that but what we're, this secret arrangement that they're talking about places China in the position to destroy our economy on the whim. Well, actually... You got to think about this. If China at one point old, owned 1.4 trillion of U.S. debt in the form of bonds, uh, and then Chinese uh, management decided that, hey, we need to limit this to 1 trillion in holdings, never exceed, we can't afford 1 trillion. Let me ask you this. If they needed to go to war, it would cost more with us. It would cost them more than a trillion dollars. But all they got to do is give up their trillion dollars, and we would be an economic bankrupt nation where the 10 FEMA camp regions would be processing us. What? Yes, it's true. Our government does not care. It's run by insane, bought-off, maniacal... I, I, don't, I don't even have a word for it. I it just could go on about it. But it's you. It's not the leaders that are the problem in this case. It's us, the followers. We enable these insane psychopaths to hire the sociopaths that run our civilization. It's time to turn it around. I could say wake up, but that's just a term. You wake up every morning. It doesn't mean much. You're still asleep if you don't know what we're talking about here. The relationship between China and America in this way is sold to the public as a necessary symbiosis. The Chinese sell goods to America and park the dollars they earn back in America by purchasing U.S. treasuries. What is not discussed is the fact that this perpetually expands the national debt in an attempt to artificially keep interest rates low. The biggest part of the scam is the fact that the private Federal Reserve electronically creates piles of money that causes inflation. Inflation is a hidden tax on all Americans present with wealth. Inflation is not just a monetary freaking phenomena. It's something that is done on purpose in this situation. It's being held at bay, but it's going to bite us, and it's going to bite us hard. It's called hyperinflation in a stagnant economy. One day, e economists theorize that that's not even possible. Well, it is. It's here, and it's getting worse. It remains difficult to locate any Federal Reserve cartel member of Treasury official to comment on this story. 
as it is a highly sensitive topic due to the blatant perversion of capitalism, American sovereignty, and resulting national security risk. Make no mistake, what is being conjured up here is the collapse of both the American economy and the Chinese central bank to ensure they both line up at the international banker trial and accept a one world currency and government. I'm Michael Wordsworth, telling you like it is. Words worth listening to. I was outside all the time when I was a kid, but I never found dead bees. Once in a while, maybe once in a while, you'd actually find a legitimate dead bee, but it's because I was a kid and I was digging through the grass, and I think once I did find one. One. Now I find them almost every time I step out into the garden. What am I talking about? Colony collapse disorder. It's one of it's a real disorder, not like the fake psychiatric disorders they make up to tell you, of course you're depressed and have anxiety. You're being screwed in every direction and you're ignorant to it. You're feeling something very real and you normally would be compelled to act, but they give you drugs to calm you down. Well, colony collapse disorder is a real environmental threat, and now Monsanto, that giant corporate conglomerate that controls the majority of our agricultural production, is hunting down whistleblowers who expose the fact that their herbicides are causing the death of these bees. Monsanto the massive biotechnology company being blamed for contributing to the dwindling bee population has brought up one of the leading bee collapse research organizations. I apologize, it's bought up, not brought up. Recently banned from Poland, with one of the primary reasons being that the company's genetically modified corn may be devastating the dying bee population, it is evident that Monsanto is under serious fire for their role in the downfall of the vital insects. Hey, without bees, you're not going to have cantaloupe, almonds, there's a whole list of crops you're not going to have. Einstein himself said, when the bees die in this world, look out, it's over. It is therefore quite apparent why Monsanto bought one of the largest bee research firms on the planet. You buy up your opposition, it's called controlled opposition. It can be found in public company reports hosted on mainstream media that Monsanto scooped up the BeeLogix firm back in September 2011. During this time, the correlation between Monsanto's GM crops and the bee decline was not explored in the mainstream. And in fact, it was hardly touched upon until Polish officials addressed the serious concern amid the monumental ban. Owning a major organization that focuses heavily on the bee collapse and is recognized by the USDA for their mission statement of restoring bee health and protecting the future of insect pollination could be a very advantageous for Monsanto. In fact, Bee Logic's company information states that the primary goal of the firm is to study the very collapse disorder that is thought to be a result, at least in part, of Monsanto's own Frankenstein creations. Franken food, I call them. I kill you, I eat me, I you die. While its primary goal is to control the colony collapse disorder, an Israeli acute paralysis virus infection crisis, Bee Logic's mission is to become the guardian of bee health worldwide. What's more, Bee Logic's is recognized by the USDA. The USDA the media leading entomologists worldwide. It's an important institution that the Monsanto corporate bee killers should not own. They will control the opposition, and once again, the media will be put out that they had nothing to do with it. Well, they're not just killing the bees, they're killing you too. Sterility rates are up, cancer rate, diabetes. Look into it, GMO foods, genetically modified foods. These aren't the good ones. They're going to be the death of the uh, population, the death of the food supply. The USDA, of course, has a great relationship with Monsanto. No kidding. 
How did that happen? I'll tell you how that happened. Because Monsanto has a lot of ex-CEOs in the FDA. Just the way that Goldman Sachs has a lot of ex-CEOs and members on the uh, Federal Reserve Board. The government agency has gone to great lengths to ensure that Monsanto's financial gains continue to soar, going as far as to give the company special speed approval for passing through their newest genetically engineered seed varieties. It turns out that Monsanto was not getting quick enough approval for their crops, which have been linked to severe organ damage and other significant health concerns. Steve Sensky, CEO of the American Soybean Association, states it quite plainly. It was a move to help Monsanto and other biotechnology giants squash competition and make profits. After all, who cares about public health? I do. You do. Ultimately, if you hadn't thought about it, you care about public health. You're part of the public. Quote, Sensky said, it is a concern from a competition standpoint. In a telephone interview, he said that Monsanto, this is not a good idea. It appears that when Monsanto cannot answer for their environmental devastation, you know about BP, you know about Fukushima, the oil spill and the nuclear reactors, but you don't know about this. The bees, they're dying. They've been dying for years. Do you see it in the news? Sure, somebody must have told you. My goodness, every day I've got something to tell you. There's like 20,000 issues of critical condition pending situations that we need to be informed of. We have no choice. We can't ignore them. Well, Monsanto, they buy up a company that may potentially be their experts in denying any such link between their crops and the bee decline. Unbelievable. An Illinois beekeeper with more than a decade's worth of expertise about how to successfully raise organic, chemical-free bees is the latest victim of flagrant government tyranny. According to the Prairie Advocate, Terrence Terry Ingram of Apple River, Illinois, owner of Apple Creek Apiaries, recently had his bees and beehives stolen from him by the Illinois Department of Agriculture. Stolen! Just like the Michigan farmers that are being subjected to having their pigs killed because suddenly they, their domesticated pigs are an invasive species. They have to shoot them or face felony fines or $10,000, uh, felony charges or $10,000 fines. Well, now you hear, you have this guy in Illinois, they're seizing his bee farm. Who? Monsanto's behind it. Because... This guy had more than 15 years worth of research proving Monsanto's Roundup, the herbicide Roundup, to be the cause of colony collapse disorder. And they destroyed that evidence. Or at least they'd like to. Hopefully he's got copies. It began last summer when Ingram, who teaches children about natural beekeeping, very good thing to do, gave a sample of his honeycomb to the IDO. ID of A, Inspector Susan Cavico, ID of A, another acronym for another institution that runs your life. That's all you really need to know. If you can't remember these damn acronyms, just know that it's just another. Anyhow, uh, he was at a beekeeper's picnic. I mean, what could be more harmless or wholesome than a picnic full of beekeepers talking about beekeeping? And this guy passes on this information. He gave a sample of his honeycomb to the inspector, hoping that maybe she'd do something with it. Ingram explained that his bees would not touch the comb and asked Kivico if it could be tested for chemical contamination. Well, Kivico told him that the ID of A does not test for chemicals. Ah, right, you you don't know a lab anywhere? Presumably because its policy is to actively promote them. (laughs) <laughs> I see. It's the wrong people to give your honeycomb to, Mr. Ingram. Yeah. I bet you know that now. Well, then instead, they took the comb and had it tested for foul brood, a disease that Ingram says is greatly overblown. When the test allegedly came back positive, Kavico proceeded to get the ball rolling on a witch hunt that would eventually lead to the illegal seizure and destruction of Ingram's personal property. 
Not only did Kaviko, as well as her colleague, betray him, her colleague Eleanor Balson joined in the betrayal and Superior Stevens D. Chard. Thanks a lot, guys. Break the law by trespassing Ingrid's property on numerous occasions without a warrant. But they also committed numerous crimes by stealing his hives and equipment and destroying pertinent evidence before a hearing, which Ingram believes may have ultimately been rooted in a deliberate conspiracy. Um, I think you're right, Mr. Ingram. A conspiracy by the state to hide the truth about Roundup, the common herbicide, pesticide, killing the bees, and subsequently steal his most vibrant bees. They, they took his most vibrant bees. Well, the IDFA appears to have targeted Ingram for his research linking Roundup to CCD, the death of the bees. Of particular interest was Ingram's extensive research on Monsanto's Roundup herbicide, which began several years ago when hundreds of Ingram's hives had died. He became concerned. He later determined that Roundup sprains near his property were to blame. He wasn't putting it on his property. It was being sprayed around his property and just drifted over, which prompted him to actively research the subject and closely monitor his hives in conjunction with this research from that point onward. What he gathered and subsequently taught to others was concrete evidence that Roundup kills bees. He also used this information and his many years of experience to develop and refine ways of growing strong. Chemical-free bees in spite of Roundup sprains, a move that apparently upset the idea of A, which operates primarily to serve the interest of chemical companies rather than the interests of people. The Prairie Advocate stated that is Illinois becoming a police state where citizens do not rights have not have no rights? That's what Mr. Ingram wants to know. Who has been deliberately denied his rights. Knowing that Monsanto and the Department of Agriculture are in bed together, that's one way to put it, they're in bed together, one has to wonder if Monsanto was behind the theft to ruin his research that may prove Roundup was and is killing honeybees. Michael Wordsworth, the death of the bees. Look into it, Google it. It's one way to stay informed. Back in a moment. Some Western countries are still considering a military operation against Iran as an option over its nuclear program. A Russian minister said Sunday this, quote, Russia is concerned that the possibility to try to solve the Iranian nuclear problem by military means is still viewed as real. Xin Hao quoted Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei, Sergei Ryabukov saying, quote, we still, we still hear messages from public and intelligence channels which show that certain capitals regard this option as much more applicable to the situation around Iran than it was before. He said this upon his return from the G8 summit in the U.S. Ryabukov warned such an operation against Iran will inevitably bring negative effect for the security of many countries and dire consequences for the global economy. Absolutely. The NDAA 2013 now featuring propaganda and war with Iran. Congressman Ron Paul wants to know, what if the American people woke up and understood that the official reasons for going to war are almost always based on lies and promoted by war propaganda in order to serve special interests? It's a good question, Congressman Ron Paul. Nary a week seems to go by around this here site where we don't mention the insidious indefinite detention provisions of the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act signed under the cover of New Year's Eve by President Obama without as much as a whimper from dissent from the mainstream media. Well, heck, we've had so many bills passed against us. I guess what's one more? We've been trying to counter that whimper with a constant roar of protest. Here at Breaking Down the News, there have certainly been some positive grassroots development in battling the NDA in the past half year or so. 
Whether it's the formation of grassroots groups such as PANDA, People Against National Defense Act, attempts by states to nullify indefinite detention or the recent ruling of a federal judge blocking the indefinite detention provisions, it's clear that resistance to this aggregation, resistance to this violation of our national rights is strong. The NDAA, if you're not aware, is the, uh, it allows the government the legal basis to indefinitely detain a citizen without a trial, without due process, without habeas corpus. <sighs> well, just when we were starting to make some progress against the 2012 NDAA, both in raising public awareness and measurable legal victories, those creepy Congress critters are already at it again. Hard at work in the 2013 version of this new bill, the NDAA that was signed by President Obama in secret on New Year's Eve, the NDAA is an omnibus bill that comes up every year in order to fully fund the armed forces, including present military action abroad. As with nearly every major bill, congressmen use the opportunity of such a large and important bill to sneak in all sorts of shady little provisions, knowing that almost everyone will vote for the final bill or else face the heinous charges of not supporting the troops. We have to destroy America Therefore, you have to support the troops. That's what supporting the troops means. Destroy America. I'm being facetious. I'm being sarcastic. I love America. Now more than ever. Maybe it's just me, but sending our troops across the globe to fight in multiple illegal, unsustainable wars while military suicides exceed combat deaths doesn't sound like supporting the troops. But hey, what do I know? I'm just some dude with a radio show here talking about his passion for liberty. Once you know it, Congress has already gone and passed the first version of the 2013 NDA, which includes all sorts of tasty tyranny nuggets. As this latest version creeps its way through the Senate and eventually to the desk of the POTUS, let's stop and take a look at a couple of exciting new additions this year's bill will provide us Number one, an amendment that would strike the current ban on domestic dissemination of propaganda by the State Department, essentially legalizing taxpayer-funded war propaganda within the United States. Ain't that up? As if we weren't subjected to enough war propaganda from our cable news providers, profiteers with constant fear mongering and calls for war on Iran and just about anyone else that might look at us funny. This amendment will cut out the middleman and allow the State Department to deliver its lies directly to us. Just like Monsanto buying up the very bee research team company that would reveal that Roundup is killing the bees. Well, they're going to <laughs> They're going to get rid of the middleman in this case. The start, State Department will be able to say whatever it wants. Speaking about war, well, another new revision in 2013 we're going to find in the NDAA. Point number two, as Representative Dennis Kucinich has warned, Dennis Kucinich has warned the 2013 NDAA essentially authorizes a war against Iran. Remember, you go to war with Iran, there's no reason to do it. You're going to pay for it at the pump and elsewhere, but it'll start right there at the pump, right away. You're going to be broke overnight, but that ain't going to be the worst of it. You're just going to be hurting for money really bad, but you won't be completely bankrupt. But if it keeps going, it will, and then eventually you will be bankrupt. If this goes through, it shall be the policy of the United States to take all necessary measures, including military action if required, to prevent Iran from threatening the United States, its allies, or Iran's neighbors with a nuclear weapon. You know what? Right next to Iran is Pakistan, and we gave them the freaking nuclear weapon. I think they're the most likely ones to, uh, to use it. In all seriousness, let's just keep pissing them off, killing our, their people with our drones. Well, not to be outdone, Section 1222 states, United States military preparedness in the Middle East ramps it up with specifics. What specifics? These. 
pre-positioning sufficient supplies of aircraft, munitions, fuel, and other materials for both air and sea-based missions at key forward locations in the Middle East and Indian Ocean. Another specific, maintaining sufficient naval assets in the region necessary to signal the United States resolve and to bolster United States capabilities to launch a sustained sea and air campaign against a range of Iranian nuclear and military targets. Are you crazy? It's not Iraq. Iran is not Iraq. It isn't going to go down that easy. It doesn't get much clearer than that now, does it? Not only does the 2013 NDAA authorize war with Iran and fund the preparations for such war, it even authorizes the propaganda needed to go with it for what will surely be a hard-to-sell, war-weary American public. Expert, more war propaganda like this and expect to pay for it. The one provision in the 2013 NDAA that, on the surface, looks like a positive is an amendment that supposedly reaffirms the right of habeas corpus actually does nothing of the sort. The Gomert Amendment states that the NDAA does not deny the writ of habeas corpus or deny any constitutional rights for persons detained in the United States under the AUMF who are entitled to such rights. You see that little trick here? You're entitled to habeas corpus rights as long as you're entitled to them. However, sections 1021 and 1022 of the 2012 NDAA stripped those rights, and the 2013 version does nothing whatsoever to change it. According to Steve Vladdeck of American University's Law School, he said this, quote, the Gomert Amendment does nothing whatsoever to address the central objections. It merely provides by statute a remedy that is already available to individuals detained within the United States and says nothing about the circumstances in which individuals might actually be subject to military detention when arrested by the territory of the United States. Anyone within the United States who was subject to military detention before the FY 2013 NDA would be subject to it afterwards as well. There was one amendment offered that would have explicitly prohibited indefinite detention. The Amish Smith Amendment, also co-sponsored by Ron Paul, that was, of course, predictably shot down. We can never relent in the fight against growing tyranny both at home and abroad. The first step to solving problems on as grand a scale as the extraordinary powers granted by the 2012-13 NDAs bill is to make people aware that there is a problem in the first place. We know by now that the revolution will not be televised and nor will the tales of tyranny that necessitate it. Help us restore the Bill of Rights. Help us stop a war. Help us spread the word about the NDAA. I'm Michael Wordsworth. This has been Breaking Down the News with words worth listening to. I'm out of here. Have a good day.